Come ride the little train that is rolling down the tracks to the junction. Forget about your cares, it is time to relax at the junction. Lots of curves, you bet, and even more when you get to the junction. Petticoat Junction. There's a little hotel called the Shady Rest at the junction. Petticoat Junction. It is run by Kate. Come and be her guest at the junction. Petticoat Junction. And that's Uncle Joe. He's a moving kind of slow at the junction. Petticoat Junction. you ordered with your name painted on by hand. No doubt. Hey, Mom. Yes, yes, for you, for you. Anything for me? For Billy Joe from the Hollywood Lingerie Company. Better not be black. Uh, uh, or pink. I hope they didn't make a mistake. If they're black, they're going your hope chest and not in your bureau. <laughs> Bobby Joe? Oh, it's my latest selection from the book club. Don't start reading till I get a chance to look at it. <laughs> my goodness it's a hollywood glamour wig it's guaranteed to bring new excitement into my life or i get my money back do i look like a movie star yes like an old movie star named harpo marx i bet she was beautiful oh the things those silly kids throw away their good money on <laughs> oh oh i hope it didn't break that's my genuine scat wrinkle magic youth beauty cream. <laughs> Uncle Joe, aren't you going to take your tie in the closet and see if it lights up the way it's supposed to? In a while. to be true. What is it, Mom? Mrs. Stroud is coming to look us over. Who's Mrs. Stroud? You mean you never saw Gladys Stroud's travel column in the Centerville Sun Express? Oh, that Mrs. Stroud. Gee, that's swell, Mom. Oh, sure. Her recommendation can make a hotel. I've been trying to get her here for three years. <laughs> I wonder what she means by that. Thrilled by your exciting brochure. Same brochure we've been sending her for four years. Never got her excited before. Hmm. Wonder what's in here to fire up her boilers. Each floor with its own private bath. That isn't very exciting. Most rooms with screens. Fly swatters free on request. I couldn't have done it. Enjoy the summer heat without noisy air conditioning. Well, anyway, she's coming. <laughs> Coming to stay with us, Gladys Stroud, the newspaper column Stroud. Yeah, I know. When I called the Centerville Sun Express to stop her, they told me she was already on her way here. Oh, can you imagine? I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> you called to stop her? You didn't say that, did you? That's what I said. When did you call the Centerville Sun Express to stop her? And why would you do that? Skip when, get to why. Well, as soon as I found out about the mistake, I rushed right into Hooterville and called her right then. Is this going to be something I can take standing up, or is it a sitter? <laughs> Might be a fainter. <laughs> what mistake did you find out about? Well, you remember when I told you about making up that brochure... 
shady rest hotel of the future? You mean the one you were going to use to get a big loan at the bank? The one all about swimming pools and tennis courts? That's the one. Well, I just wanted a few copies of my brochure of the future made up to show to the bank. Uncle Joe. You... Yeah? The way this story is going, put away the knife. <laughs> You ain't the time. I know, but don't put temptation in my path. <laughs> now, go on. So the new man at the print shop made a mistake and he mailed out Uncle Joe's crazy brochure to our regular mailing list. And that's the one Mrs. Stroud got. You mean she's coming here expecting to see a swimming pool and... And tennis courts? And private baths and whatever else What's-His-Name dreamed up. What's-His-Name? She means Uncle... Oh, I forbid you to mention that person's name. <laughs> Look, Mom, couldn't we just explain the mistake to Mrs. Stroud? Like the owner of the hotel in Greenville tried to explain to her when she found out his new chef was Canadian and not French like he had said in his advertisement? Oh, yes. She practically ran him out of business. She even tried to put him in jail for false advertising. Oh, hello, girl. Anybody talks to him gets her wig taken away. <laughs> and if he knows what's good for him, he better get down to Hooterville and get Mrs. Stroud before she gets on the train and talk her out of coming here. Well, what's he supposed to tell her? That woman's supposed to be a rip-snorting she-devil. Well... He better tell her the truth and beg her to forgive him so she won't close us up for false advertising and so she won't put him in jail. That's my advice to him. Now, hold on just a minute. We're being awful serious about this. Kind of comical when you think about it, just a little mistake. <laughs> a little funny mix-up. It's kind of humorous. <laughs> well, I've got news for him. If making up crazy brochures full of tennis courts, swimming pools, and private baths and getting those brochures sent by mistake to a woman who's more than likely going to close me up and deprive a poor widow of her only means of supporting her three fatherless daughters might be funny to him. But to me, it's a far piece from Barney Google. <laughs> Willie drank his taxi cab. Must be Mrs. Stroud. Now, don't you be afraid of her. You just tell her the truth and throw yourself on her mercy. Good luck, and I'll see you later. Throw myself on her mercy. And I intend to report you to the Better Business Bureau. But, ma'am, it ain't my fault if that meter jumps ten cents when we hit a bump. I always take it off the bill. Yes, when you get caught. I'll see that you're prevented from cheating the public. Listen, ma'am, I got me three kids to support. Gladys Stroud never lets sentiment sway her from her duty to her public. That mercy I'm going to throw myself on, I don't think there's enough there to break the fall. <laughs> Uncle Joe so long getting back from Hooterville. Well, it probably took him a couple of hours of talking to Mrs. Stroud to get up the nerve to tell her the truth. You think everything's all right then, Mom? Oh, sure. By now he's explained all about the mix-up with the brochures and everything, and she's had a good laugh, and she's on her way back to Centerville. That must be Uncle Joe now. Right this way, Mrs. Stroud. You can see the swimming pool and the tennis courts in the morning. <laughs> well, suppose she does have to leave first thing in the morning. Train doesn't get here till 11 o'clock. Now she's still going to want to see the tennis courts and swimming pool. I'm going to tell her the truth. Now, get a hold of yourself, Kate. I've got it all planned. Floyd and Charlie are going to have the train here at 8.30 instead of 11. But it's crazy. She'll be here tonight. We'll never make Mrs. Stroud think she's in a hotel with private baths, swimming pools, and tennis courts. Well, it's the bowling alley and the indoor ice skating rink that's got me worried. <laughs> ice skating rink? <laughs> Uncle Joe, 
What else did you put in that brochure? You better tell me. Well, there's, there's no sense in us both being sick. <laughs> just put yourself in my hands, Kate. I got you into this trouble, and I'm going to get you out. Now, just say to yourself, I'm leaving myself in Uncle Joe's capable hands. I just wish there was something less ridiculous I could say to myself. <laughs> I put her bags in the room right next to the bath. I'm going to put my big radio up there. And this. What's that? Don't you remember when I sent for them two-way telephones from that catalog? I'm going to run a wire from her window down to this. Then she'll be able to call down for room service. We'll make out like we got a switchboard. Get it? Oh, boy, are we going to get it. I can't go through with it. I'm going to tell her the truth. It's the only way. Okay. Well, maybe you're right. She probably won't close the hotel. She'll be satisfied just to send me to jail. You're working on me now. <laughs> oh, don't worry about me. They won't keep Uncle Joe on that rock pile more than a couple of months. In fact, with my heart, I may not live that long. All right, you old faker, you. Get your tail out from between your legs. I'll do my best. Maybe we can't make Mrs. Stroud think that this is a first-class luxury hotel. Kate, you'll never regret it. I'm going to run up to her room. Install this telephone in that big radio mine. And this is going to be fun. <laughs> Uncle Joe? Yeah? You're cuckoo. <laughs> Makes one to know what. Miss Bradley? Cuckoo. <laughs> My mind was wandering. Uh, how was dinner? Oh, wholesome country cooking, typical of the region. Well, so far, this seems to be the primitive inn I've always imagined. I can't believe it contains the lavish facilities described in your brochure. We try to keep it primitive at night. You'll see all the lavish stuff in the morning. <laughs> I thought you served dinner in the crystal room. Oh, boy. <laughs> the crystal room's closed for repairs. A few cracked crystals. <laughs> you know about crystals. <laughs> you just look cross-eyed at them and they cry. <laughs> uh, I see. Uh, well, I think I'll go up to my room and take a bath. Oh, may I have my key? Oh, yes, of course. There we are. Thank you. Hey, Ma, did you see this? Oh, my goodness. That salesman from Ogden just taking a bath, and Mrs. Stroud thinks that's her private bathroom. Bobby Joe, stop her. Tell her anything. Show her your snapshots. I've got to go up the back steps and get that salesman out of the bathroom. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Stroud! Mrs. Stroud? Oh, oh, they call her frivolous. Fire! Fire! Motel's on fire! What's going on? Mrs. Stroud's coming up to take a bath. Well, gee, Josefeta, I forgot about the private bath. Yeah, now, I'll get him out of here, and you go through the bedroom and clean up that bath, you hear? Fire! What fire? Where? 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 Downstairs. You go down the back stairs and wash off the suds. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Stroud, don't you want to see any more pictures? You can show me the rest of your pictures later. I'm going to take my bath. Uh, hello, Mrs. Stroud. Uh, welcome to the second floor. I uh, say so you're ready for your bath, Mrs. Stroud. <laughs> You certainly do get around. Are you all right? Oh, yes, yes, it's just when I run up the steps too fast, sometimes I kind of get the bends. Hi, Miss Stroud. I just put the big radio in your room. Radio? Oh, I suppose you don't get television here. Well, I saw it in Greenville once, and I didn't get it there either. It's a real good radio, though. Once in a while, she'll quit on you. But you just kick her in the side, you usually bring her around. I kicked a lot of good entertainment out of that set. <laughs> now, Mrs. Stroud, you, you go ahead and take your bath and have a nice soak and a good night's sleep, and we'll see you in the morning. Yes, indeed. Need anything, just pick up the phone. Yeah, would you like a bowl of fruit with some peaches and a few bananas? Yeah, that's a good idea. How about a couple of nuts? Yes, how about that? <laughs> Feeling any better? Uh -oh. Suppose Mrs. Stroud wants to make a phone call and she finds out we don't have any telephone wires and that that phone on the wall is just to give the hotel class. Keep your mind cheerful. She's leaving the first thing in the morning. She won't have time to see anything. Have to take our word for it. Make you feel better? Well... Where's the gun? It's a rattler. That's the phone. This is Stroud. Maybe she wants me to come up and kick the radio. Well, what do I do? Pick it up. Make out like your switchboard. Hello? 
for which part speaking? <laughs> Give her room service, please. Uh, uh, just a moment, you'll connect her. Just a moment, I'll connect you. <laughs> Good evening. Room service. Well, a glass of warm milk? Right away, Mrs. Stroud. Good night. Nothing to it. <laughs> it wasn't hard. It was sort of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. She probably wants to order some crackers with the milk. <laughs> Good evening. What? Just a moment. Room service? No, Chicago. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What'll I say? I'm only good for room service. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Stroud? Well, what number? Randolph 61599. Just a moment. Uncle Joe. I don't understand it. Usually in emergencies like this, I can manage to come up with a brainstorm. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Uh, Stroud. Uh, there was a storm on the other side of the mountains and some of the telephone lines are down. <laughs> well, yes, uh, if they get it fixed tonight, I'll... Oh, in the morning. Yes, fine. Good night. You're going to congratulate me? You mean for being smart enough to have me around? Well, I was great on room service. <laughs> Stroud. All right. What's she doing up so early? She'll be down in ten minutes. She'd like somebody to take her on a tour so she can see the tennis courts, swimming pool, bowling alley, indoor ice skating rink, and steam rooms. <laughs> steam rooms? Listen, I got an idea. Oh, I'll bet it won't top steam rooms. <laughs> Listen, if we do it right, we can get Mrs. Stroud on that train by 8.30 and have her convinced that we got all the things it says we've got in that brochure. Now, here's what we're going to do. It'll never work. Well, if everybody does like she's supposed to, it'll work. Oh, I'm so nervous. Steam rooms. Well, a man's got to have a dream. Conrad Hilton started with a dream. If it didn't print it up and have it mailed to Mrs. Stroud. Here she comes. Battle stations. <laughs> Morning, Mrs. Stroud. Did you sleep well? Very well, thank you. Um, are you going to show me around the grounds? Oh, yes, I am. But um, first, I want you to see a most unusual and fancy elevator right over here. Most folks don't appreciate how charming this elevator is. Why, it doesn't even work. Well, darned if you didn't put your finger right on it. <laughs> Look, I want you to step in here and get the full flavor. <laughs> morning. Oh, morning, young lady. Uh, the tennis courts are to your right. <laughs> Have a good game. <laughs> now, where were we? Oh, yes, the elevator. Uh, pardon me. I think I hear someone on the bowling alley. <laughs> Folks, no bowling until after 10 o'clock. Thank you for your cooperation. Now, where were we again? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I wanted to point out certain things about... Pardon me. I wonder if that Billy Stebbins is on the indoor ice skating rink again. <laughs> Billy Stebbins, you're going to have to quit making those fast stops. You're cutting up the ice something awful. Now, stop it and slow down. Billy Stebbins, I said, slow down. <laughs> Smart Alec kid. Isn't that skating rink a little close to the bowling alley? Uh, but, yeah, but, but it, it works out. You see, it, uh, it keeps the bowlers 
cool and you automatically lose the game if you knock over a ice skater. <laughs> oh, I think I'd like to see that skating ring. Me too. We'll see it in a little while, but first I want you to see some of the historical facts in our lobby. <laughs> now. Go still now. <laughs> You're supposed to use the back stairs when coming from the swimming pool. Sorry. Huh. Kids. Now, over here, Mrs. Stroud. Oh, good morning, Miss Smith. How was the golf course today? Just lovely. 18 charming holes. But of course, we blondes have more fun than anybody. Isn't she the same young lady who just went out to play tennis with a blonde wig on? That was your cousin. Is anybody using the steam room? No, dear. Have a good steam. <laughs> I'm sorry about all the interruptions, Mrs. Stroud, but I just remembered. Miss Smith's the one who always leaves the steam door open. Excuse me. There's no steam. Where's the steam? Oh, I guess it cooled off. Close the door, Miss Smith. You're wasting the steam. Uh... Miss Smith, the steam's gone all over the place. <laughs> Just for that, Billy Stebbins, off the ice. <laughs> I've just got to have a look in there. <laughs> and what else did she threaten? I told you about closing us up and putting us in jail. What else is there? Where's Uncle Joe? He went up to romance Mrs. Stroud. Romancer? <laughs> That'll never work. Well, he's desperate. He says he won't let anyone close up this hotel. Well, I'd sure like to hear what goes on in that room. Oh, me too. Now, girls, you're not going to listen outside that door like common snoops. Mom. Gee whiz. You're going to do it like ladies with your mother along. <laughs> you mean you don't believe I love you more than I've ever loved anyone else before? No. If I'm lying, may my nose drop off. I wish I could believe that. Oh, you, you just ain't trying. What attracted you to me? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was that little glint of mischief in your eye, or that little laugh that crinkles up your nose. Oh, you're just an old faker. <laughs> All right, I give up. If I confess to lying and false advertising, will you promise just to blast at me and not hurt Kate and her girls? You mean those three girls are her daughters? Yes, ma'am. And they don't have any father. And Kate's killing herself, giving them a good bringing up and an education and doing the work of six persons running this hotel. And if she was to lose it, and I felt I was responsible, well, I just wouldn't feel like living. I can't hear a sound through this door. I hear talking, but I can't make out words. Concern those honest, solid, early American builders. <laughs> then you won't write anything bad about us in your column? I'm not a monster. You should have told me the truth yesterday. Well, you closed that hotel in Greenville, and while you were making monster noises at Willie the cab driver. <laughs> well, I guess my bark is a lot worse than my bite. And that fellow in Greenville deserved to be closed up. <laughs> Is that the little laugh that crinkles my nose? <laughs> You're adorable. Oh. You're a prince among women. <laughs> I'm going to tell Kate and the girls the good news. Oh, good. I'm glad you're all here. Uncle oh, Joe, what happened? Well, you can stop worrying about Mrs. Stroud. Then she's not closing us up after all. Thank God. Goodness. Well, it's nice to see you all so happy. Thanks to you, dear lady. Oh, we're so grateful. Oh, you should be grateful to Uncle Joe. Uh, oh, that handsome devil. Did it crinkle that time? But Mrs. Stroud, I just... Oh, call me Gladys. Gladys. I'll be expecting you in Centerville Saturday night. You're escorting me to my class reunion. Oh, I've got so many plans for us. I'll tell you all about it on the way to Hooterville. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Poor Uncle Joe. He's really too young to go steady. <laughs>
Junction. This has been a Filmways presentation. Come and listen to my story about a man named Jed. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food. And up through the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold. Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. The Beverly Hillbilly. Instead of California where the sun so warmly shines Tonight we find the Clampets in their cabin in the pines The weather is so cold hot coffee freezes in the cup And when the chickens lay their eggs they lay them standing up <laughs> Better get ready to pry that sun up in the morning and get it started. Yeah, sure we'll be glad to get back to that nice warm mansion in Beverly Hills. It ain't no fun sleeping on this cold, hard floor. Mm, that's a fact. You think that's bad? You ought to try sharing a room with that wild daughter of yourn. Well, at least ways you got a bed. That ain't a bed. That's a nest, a roost, and a den and a hutch all in one. <laughs> Is them animal friends of Ellie still coming in at night, Granny? Everything that can get through the window. Why don't you shut the window? Because I can't sleep without fresh air. Especially with that third party in bed with us. What third party? Ellie, can you come out here and bring your friend with you? Yeah, Granny. Uh, don't you worry about it, Granny. I'll chuck it out. Whatever it is, got to get your sleep. It's all us, Granny. Your pa wants that pole cat. Give it to him. Now, wait a minute. Don't point that thing at me. You don't want to get drove outdoors on a night like this. Well, don't you want him, Pa? I just want to say that Granny'd appreciate it if he'd have this little fella sleep with his own family. All right, I'll go get the other thing. Oh, no, no, no. Outdoors with his family. Otherwise, when we go to California, they might not take him back in. And if a skunk ain't welcome with his own family, he just about ain't got nobody to turn to. All right, I'll put him out the window. Uncle Jed, why can't we go back to Beverly Hills right away? Reckon we can tell him the truth, Granny? I reckon he's big enough. Well, you see, we promised your ma we'd stay here and help her till she gets herself married to Mr. Brewster. Well, how long will that take? Well, it hadn't ought to take long. She's got him boarding in your room now where she can get at him. Pearl told me tonight's the night. She's going to feed him into a stupor, then set him in the parlor and sing to him until he proposes. That's a powerful combination, Pearl cooking and singing. Yeah. If he can get got, Pearl will get him. <laughs> uh, uh, ain't that a precious picture? <sighs> Niagara Falls. Where the honeymooners go. <laughs> Understand they're having special winter rates there now. I think I'd better turn in. I've got to get up awfully early. No, 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 no. You sit down and relax. Jethreen and me's got a special surprise for you. It isn't food, is it? Food for the soul and the spirit. Music. What would you like to hear? Oh, anything you'd like to sing. Well, I'll just pick out something at random. <laughs> Let's try this, Jeffrey. Oh, promise me that someday you and I Take our love together to some sky where we can be alone and faith renewed. <laughs> 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 Got them all so stirred up tonight. Oh, 
door, but something sure is setting them off. Too, Granny? Hey, sure is. Now, then, goes right to you. It ain't their hollering that's getting me. It's their snoring. <laughs> <laughs> Look for yourself. Ellie's got two of them under the bed. <laughs> Granny, we gotta get that girl back to Beverly Hills. She's going right back to being a wild cougar. What y'all all doing out here? Trying to keep warm. Sure it's cold in there without you, Granny. Mind if I join you? I reckon so, if you don't mind a little human company for a change. Uncle <laughs> Jed, we just got to get ourselves back to Beverly Hill. We will, Jethro, as soon as your maw gets proper hitched to Mr. Brewster. <laughs> Bless you. Oh, Pearl, give it all you got tonight. Oh, we's all going to be down with P. Pneumotony. <laughs> <laughs> just a song at twilight when the nights are low. And the flickering shadows softly come and go. It was a wonderful concert. You both are uh, unusually talented. Thank you. Yes, indeed. That, that means a lot coming from you. Naturally, folks around here brag on us. In fact, they think we ought to go on a concert tour. Oh, really? Oh, yes. My neighbors is always after me to sing out of town. <laughs> well, I can understand that. Uh, mi Mr. Brewster, do you really like music and singing? Well, I used to. I mean, I used to sing a lot myself in college musicals, amateur theatricals. Was you on the stage, Mr. Brewster? Oh, yes, yes. After college, I did quite a bit of little theater work, summer stock. Matter of fact, there was a time when I seriously considered the stage as my career. Ma, Mr. Brewster's an actor. Well, not any longer. My father had other ideas. He insisted I get into the oil business. Uh, Mr. Brewster, did you ever do anything from the Bard or Avon? That's Shakespeare. Oh, I just love him. <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, I once played the lead in Romeo and Juliet. Which one was you? <laughs> I was Romeo. Uh, in my youth, I was considered quite a, quite a leading man type. And there were those who thought I had rather a handsome profile. Well, you still got it. And I'll bet you can act to beat the band. Oh, come on. Take off a part for us. Something from Shakespeare. Sit down, Jeffrey. Well, I doubt if I can remember anything. Oh, please, Mr. Brewster. Well, uh, perhaps I can recall something from the balcony scene. Let's see now. Uh, how did it go? Uh, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, are far more fair than she. Go to bed, Jethreen. Uh, well, I think I'll turn in. Oh, well, uh, uh, please, do some more of them love speeches from Shakespeare. Well, my throat is a little sore. I think I'd better gargle a little warm salt water and go to bed. Well, I can take care of you. That's another one of my specialties, nursing the sick. Well, it might be the flu bug, and you wouldn't want to catch it. Uh, good night. If his flu bug is as hard to catch as he is, I got nothing to worry about. <laughs> Jed, have you ever noted to be so cold? Never have, Jethro. Ah, this ain't cold. Your blood is thinned out from living in California. You say this ain't cold, Granny? Look who else has huddled up to the fire. Ellie and her wolves. <laughs> morning, Granny. Cold? You call this cold? Well, I remember a winter morning that was so cold 
that when I went to milk the cow, the milk froze before it hit the pail. And break it off in sticks. Yes, sir. I carried a double armful of milk in and never spilled a stick. Gee, Granny, how'd you drink it? Bite on it? Nope. <laughs> but you did. <laughs> You're in a right good mood this morning. Jeff, I got a feeling in my bones that Pearl got him last night. Oh, I seen Mr. Brewster's car coming down the road, and ain't Pearl's with him. I told him, my bones is never wrong. <laughs> Hi, Ma. Happy Charge. Yeah, let us see your ring, Pearl. You want me to carry Mr. Brewster over the threshold for you, Ma? <laughs> she don't look too happy. <laughs> she don't sound too happy, neither. Oh, all well, women folk cry when they're about to get married. I didn't get him. Oh. Did you try your best, Pearl? Oh, Granny, I throwed the book at him. Cooking, sewing, singing. I even nursed him through the flu. Got him well in five minutes. <laughs> but he didn't propose. Jed, you go off there and do your duty to your female cousin. Ask that city fella what he'd rather get. Married or buried. Now, <laughs> Granny, I don't hold with hitting folks married unless it's willing. Pearl's got enough willing for both of them. <laughs> Are you going to make a liar out of my bones? Yeah, I'll have a talk with Mr. Brewster. Where'd he go, Pearl? He said he was going to park the car on the warm side of the cabin. But he must have run off. After him, everybody, we'll head him off at the pass and shoot him down like a dog. Now, you hold on. You ain't shooting nobody down. Just simmer down. Why, he didn't run off at all. Except we'll need you, Ellie, to get him back in here. How come? Uh, looks like a couple of your friends are sizing him up for breakfast. <laughs> Well, in all sincerity, Mr. Pampett, your, your cousin Pearl is a very remarkable woman. It's just that, well, I, I don't want to get married. Oh, I understand that, Mr. Brewster, and I thank you for speaking the truth like a man, but my cousin Pearl has got herself a problem. Oh, what's that? Well, uh, ain't no secrets in the hills. Everybody's dog knows that you've been boarding with her over at her place, and they all know she's had her cap set for you. Oh, I ain't blaming you, Mr. Brewster. Jed? Did he say yes? Can we come out now? Well, not yet a while, Granny. Well, if you're too chicken to shoot him, Ellie's got her wool standing by. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Brewster, in order to save my cousin Pearl from shame, I'm going to ask you to do me a big favor. Anything I can do. I want you to propose to her in front of somebody. But... And let her turn you down, of course. Oh. Oh, I see. Of course, yes, that'll save face. Uh, uh, well, uh, Pearl will know that she's supposed to turn me down. Oh, sure. We'll have an understanding with Pearl. Now, the one I think you ought to propose in front of is Elverna Bradshaw. You know, Mr. Clampett, this idea of yours is quite inspired. Oh, it's just a notion. You see, Elverna is the biggest gossip in the hill. No, really, it's brilliant. It combines drama, pathos, suspense. It has a happy ending. Great third act curtain. It's, it's, it's real theater. Of course, you'll have to be convincing so Elverna will... Convincing? Why, I'll give a performance that the people of these hills will remember as long as they live. <laughs> well, just so that... Uh... When Pearl Bodine turns down my impassioned proposal of marriage, there won't be a dry eye in the house. <laughs> Elverna, don't cry easy. Oh, well, now, surely you're not going to waste this dramatic scene before just one person. Well, I reckon Elverna's daughter... I've got it. I've got it at the movie house where Pearl plays the piano. You want to propose there? Well, it's perfect. Everybody in town will see it. I well, want to kind of shame you to be turned down in front of all them people? Well, it's, it's just a performance. I've learned one thing in the theater. An actor always gives a better performance in front of a full house. Well, doggies. That sure is nice, are you? <laughs> it's, my, it's my pleasure, Mr. Clampett. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Bodine. Granny, uh, come on in. Come, come on here, everybody. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. I reckon we better let Mr. Brewster tell you what's going to happen. Oh. Well, 
Tonight, at the movie house, Mrs. Bodine, while the whole town looks on, I'm going to ask you to marry me. Until you hear the rest of the story. Now, Pearl, when Mr. Brewster asks you to marry him, you're going to say no. Not unless I'm as drunk as you are. <laughs> Jethro went on ahead down to the theater to get a fire going in the stove. Where's Jeff Freeman, Pearl? Why, she's in her room getting dressed. Go on in and see her. Granny, what happened to your mink coat? This is it. Tonight's kind of special, so I'm wearing the pretty side out. <laughs> you sure got your pretty side out tonight, Pearl? Oh, I tell you, Jed, I'm as nervous as if I was going to get a real honest-to-goodness proposal. And it would be real if your cousin Jed would do his duty and hold a shotgun on that fellow, Brewster. <laughs> now, ladies, let's settle for what we got. This way, Pearl can come to California without nobody saying she left town in disgrace. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Ain't you dressed up? That boiled shirt makes your face look kind of dark. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm wearing a little theatrical makeup. <laughs> Mrs. Bodine, uh, how would you like some pancake on your face? How'd you like some sweet potato pie on yours? <laughs> Fetch me some hot possum grease, Pearl, and I'll fling it on her. Now, ladies, you misunderstood me. Pancake is a type of makeup we use in the theater. An actor like myself would feel positively undressed without it. I thought you was oil man. Well, that's my business. But at heart, I shall always be an actor. <laughs> say now, speaking of acting, you two got it figured out what you want to say? Oh, yeah, we rehearsed 12 times. Um, Mr. Brewster will be sitting on the front row. And when the picture's over, he'll jump up uh, and he's... Excuse me. Uh, I've been thinking about that. I believe it would be more effective if I made an entrance. <laughs> entrance? Yes, I'll come down the aisle. Oh, oh, all right. And then Mr. Brewster is going to say, Mrs. Bodine, don't go to California with your cousin Jed. Stay here and be my wife. Uh, excuse me. I, I, I've been thinking about that, too. Uh, after a big entrance down the aisle, that's going to seem like a pretty flat opening speech. Well, you just say what you want to say. All I got to say is, no, I won't marry you. That's Homer Winch. I'm going to hit him right in the head. Good evening, Pearl. Oh, Bernard Bradshaw, what, what are you doing here? Well, you and me being such close friends, I just thought I'd offer to play Piani for you at the theater tonight. Why? Surely you're not going to show up and have folks whispering behind your back all during the picture. <laughs> what in the world would they be whispering about? Pearl, I'm your best friend. You don't have to pretend with me. <laughs> the whole town knows how you've been flinging yourself at that border of yours. For your information, Alberta Bradshaw, Mr. Booster proposed to me 12 times today, and 12 times I turned him down. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why he give you this here mink coat? Cause you turned him down. <laughs> this here mink coat was given to me by my niece, Ella Mae Clampett. Oh, Pearl, I keep telling you, you don't have to pretend with me. I'm your best friend. <laughs> when Alverna Bradshaw is your best friend, you're up to your eyeballs and enemies. <laughs> Mr. Brewster, if you was to go in there now and propose in front of Alverna, you could save yourself a trip to the theater. The news would get around a heap quicker. You don't understand, Mr. Clampett. An actor needs an audience. <laughs> Alverna, if you don't mind, I'd like you to get out of my coat and out of my house. I'm going to be late for the theater. Pearl, take your best friend's advice and sneak out of town quietly. <laughs> you can depend on me to smooth everything over. 
Thanks for nothing. <laughs> Well, performance is right. I reckon she'll sneak out of town in a hurry if she ain't already snuck. <laughs> Mind you, Pearl's my best friend, and I ain't one to talk, but... Uh... <laughs> Good evening, lady. You too, Alverna. <laughs> oh, I noticed Mr. Brewster wasn't with her. Oh, and did you see that mink coat? Well, I wouldn't trade this little band of gold and a home-loving husband for a dozen mink coats. Would I, Luke? Luke? <laughs> Luke Bradshaw! <laughs> that new sneak, he got away again. <laughs> <laughs> mean you are leaving? Oh, yes, Mr. Brewster. I'm going to California with my cousin Jed and his family. Oh, no, 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 please. Please, I beg you. I implore you. I beseech you. Don't go. <laughs> Stay here and be my wife. <laughs> no, thank you, Mr. Brewster. <laughs> I cannot. I will not accept that answer. Oh, I love you, Pearl Bodie. I love you with all my heart. With all my soul, I love you as no man has ever loved woman before. He's better than Francis X. Bushman. Be mine. Pearl, be mine. Come back here, Mr. Brewster. <laughs> no, Mr. Brewster, my answer is no. Then your life has come to an end. But what is life without love? If I was him, I'd let it go at that. <laughs> without Pearl Bodine, there is no love. Oh, me darling, oh, me precious. Say those words that will make me the happiest of men. I'm behind you. <laughs> My answer is still no. Better quit while you're ahead, Mr. Brewster. Oh, how those words stabbed into me heart like cold steel. And only you, Pearl Bodine, can heal the mortal wound. Oh, yeah. Moon of my desire. Marry me, Pearl. No. I promise you a life of happiness. No. A life of luxury. No. Oh, me darling, look into me tear-stained eyes. Look into the tortured face of your love slave. Free me with that one divine word. Say yes. Say yes. And together we will enter a paradise of love everlasting. Yes, 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 I'll marry you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, did you say yes? Yes! <laughs> oh, 
having said yes, I was ready myself. <laughs> Time to say goodbye to Jed and all his kin. They would like to thank you folks for kindly dropping in. You're all invited back next week to this locality to have a heaping helping of their hospitality. Hillbilly, that is. Set a spell. Take your shoes off. You all come back now, here. This has been a Filmways presentation. Come ride the little train that is rolling down the tracks to the junction Forget about your cares, it is time to relax at the junction Lots of curves, you bet And even more when you get to the junction Petticoat Junction there's a little hotel called the Shady Rest at the junction. Petticoat Junction. It is run by Kate. Come and be her guest at the junction. Petticoat Junction. And that's Uncle Joe. He's a moving kind of slow at the junction. Petticoat Junction. Step out here a minute. What do you want, Herbie? Uh, look up there, Billy. It's mistletoe. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Joe, I need you. <laughs> All right, Herbie, what'd you do this time? I got kissed. <laughs> well, it sure was annoying. <laughs> Billy Joe. It's Christmas, Mom. Oh, all right. Start getting our Christmas stuff together in the back room. Floyd and Charlie will be along in a minute now. Okay. I'll help you, Billy Joe. Oh, that kid. Stealing a kiss right out here in the store. Oh, Sam, it's Christmas. Remember when you were a boy? Yeah. I ain't a boy any longer, Kate. But if I understand this custom of kissing under the mistletoe, there ain't any particular age limit on who can Sam, and who can. you talk too much. <laughs> what happened, Mr. Drucker? I got kissed. <laughs> It's all three of you. We got a lot of work to do before dark. Boy, I'll say we have. We got Christmas baskets to pack and presents to wrap and carols to rehearse. And a tree to cut and lights to string and a sleigh and reindeer to touch up. And the whole Huda built cannonball to decorate. <laughs> Only burn the loose ones, Charlie. If you keep taking up the tires, what's going to hold the rails down? Well, the train's pretty heavy, even without you. <laughs> I'll tell you where there's some tires loose. In your head. Oh, 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 oh. oh I just poop it, Charlie. I don't take up enough to hurt anything. You've been saying that for years. One of these days, we're going to find ourselves out there plowing up them fields with our cow catcher. Gee whiz, Charlie, don't be yelling at me so close to Christmas. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Floyd, but you gotta admit that Christmas Eve would be a mighty poor time for the cannonball to run off the track. All decorated up, 
Carrying a train load of carol singers, and presents and all. Speaking of presents, what do you got over there in that big package with my name on it? That's a rubber crowbar, so she can't pry up no more loose ties. <laughs> no smoke on that fire, let's highball it. Why, we might even be on time today. <laughs> Curtis, what about it? An inspection trip at Christmas time? I'd be glad to work on Christmas, New Year's, any day, if it's for the good of the CNFW Railroad. Oh, now look, Redlow, I realize you're trying to regain your position as vice president, but nobody expects you to work at Christmas. Well, that's just it. They won't be expecting me. Well, who is they? Do you know of some particular violation of CNFW rules? Yes, I do. And I understand it goes on every year at this time. Well, who is it? What is it? Where? Oh, Mr. Curtis, sir, uh, I think in all fairness, I shouldn't name names or places until I make an on-the-spot personal inspection. Well, speaking as president of the railroad, I've got to admire your devotion to the company. But speaking personally, I think you're a nut. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, that report will be on your desk the day after Christmas. Could you please come in, Miss Evans? Merry Christmas, Miss Evans. Mr. Curtis, did I actually see a smile and, and hear a Merry Christmas from old Scrooge? I mean, Mr. Bedlow? You did. And heaven held Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim, whoever they may be. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hey, fellas, where's the rest of the train? Hey, Charlie, we lost the coach. I can see that, Floyd. Did you fix that coupler like I told you? Let's see now. Did I or didn't I? Let me think. Just back up and get the coach. We got to decorate this whole train before dark. Wait a minute. It's coming back to me. Yeah, I didn't fix it. <laughs> How come the air brakes didn't stop us if you connected the air hose? Let's see now. Did I or didn't I? <laughs> you didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Well, you kept hurrying me, Charlie. Fellas, please. Back this thing up and get the coach. Calm down, Sam. We're back in... Where's the train going? The old Floyd forgot to fix the coupler and connect the air hose, and they lost the coach. Poor Floyd. He always gets so excited around Christmas. <laughs> to it. I can see it too, Smokehead. Okay, Floyd, hook up the air hose. Let's get back to Sam. Hurry up, Floyd! Cold turkey, no taper at all. Gee, Charlie, sometimes you treat me like a six-year-old child. Sometimes you act like a six-year-old child. Which just shows you can be intelligent when you try. <laughs> Go. Don't tell me it runs on schedule now. Well, it does today. You see, the boys have got to get the train out to the shady rest so Kate and the girls can decorate it tonight for... Well, I'll be doggone. This is the first time in 14 years it's been late on Christmas Eve. And it'll be the last. Hey, Charlie, 
Sure. That looks like Mr. Bedlow back at the station. What would he be doing here Christmas Eve? Maybe he brought us a present. Lord, you are really in bad shape today. <laughs> I thought they'd never get back. Well, hurry up, everybody. Well, you go ahead. I'll lock up. Mister, unless you like pumping a hand car, you better start running for that train. I don't like pumping and I don't like running. What about your taxi? Well, it can't run on the railroad track, and that's the only road. Now, the hand car's right over there. I'm not pumping any hand car. <laughs> Now, Sam, don't you start yelling at me like Charlie's been doing. It makes me nervous and I forget things. All right, Floyd. Open the door. Charlie yelling at me made me forget to fix the coupling, made me forget to connect the air holes. Floyd, nobody's yelling. It made me forget something else, too. Now, I forget what it is. Doggone it. <laughs> now, remember. <laughs> Sounds like a cow's in there. Yeah, I was supposed to leave it off at Lon Hawker's place. Christmas present for his wife. <laughs> Lloyd Smoot, we were supposed to deliver that cow someplace. Now, where? You yelled at me again, Charlie. Now, I forget. The Lon Hawker's place. That's right, Floyd. See? To Ludie with love from Lon. Here's wishing you... A white Christmas. White Christmas. Milk, get it? <laughs> Floyd, you are the dumbest ash cat that ever shook a grape. I need an ash cat now, Charlie. I'm a baggage wrestler. <laughs> well, wrestle that cow out of the way and give us the decorations. Charlie, hadn't we ought to take this cow back over to Lon's place? We ain't got time now. Charlie, please don't yell at him. You'll forget where he put the decorations. Uh, Floyd? Would you please start handing things out to us? You bet. But Charlie and Sam will have to help you with this cow. <laughs> the cow, Floyd! I don't know where Uncle Joe disappeared to. Maybe Betty will find him upstairs. Oh, Herbie, will you put these under the tree for us? We've got to find Uncle Joe. Uh, uh, Billy, uh, look up there. It's Christmas. Again? <laughs> no, it's still the same Christmas. Uh, just different mistletoe. <laughs> hey, Betty, did you find Uncle Joe? Not yet, Bobby. Well, he knows there's work to do. Look under the bed. That's the first place I look. How about the linen closet? Not there. We'll tell her to try the attic. Try the attic. Will do. Hey, where have you kids been? Looking for you. Where have you been? I've been trying to find the upper half of this Santa Claus outfit. Did you get the train all decorated? No, we haven't even started. Maybe I better go back and look some more. Uh, good job. <laughs> Mom wants you down at the train. There's work to do. It's getting late. I've got a lot of work to do on this beard. It's in bad shape. But Mr. Drucker got a brand new one. Midler. <laughs> Betty, we found him. Come on down to the train. Okay. We'll see you down the train, Mr. Carson. Okay. I'll be there right away. <laughs> <laughs> 
Where did Floyd put the light bulbs? No telling, Kate. You'll find him around back of the train. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Floyd <laughs> smoke. We got a train to decorate and Christmas carols to rehearse, and here you sit milking a cow. You needed milking, Kate. You wouldn't want her bawling right in the middle of silent night. <laughs> We're not going to take her along on the train when we go caroling. I don't see any other way to get her over to Lon Hawker's place in time for Christmas. Well, all right. Finish up as quick as you can. <laughs> hey, Sammy, here you got me a new Santa Claus beard. Yeah. What do you mean, you? I'm Santa Claus this year. You was Santa Claus last year. I was not. Floyd was. Well, what about the year before? That was Pixley Fats. See? My turn this year. Well, you can forget it. I got the suit. Not the top half, you ain't. <laughs> so you're the one that hid that. I didn't hide it. I took it home, had my landlady let it out to fit me. I will hand it over. I gotta get dressed. Where's my beard, Sam? I gave it to Kate. Kate! Kate! Oh, please, fellas, don't make a big thing about who plays Santa Claus. We haven't got time. What is it? Kate, who's gonna be Santa Claus, me or this greasy hog head? Uncle Joe, don't call Charlie that. Oh, that's just railroad talk for engineer. I don't care, I don't like it. All right, who's gonna be Santa Claus, me or this greasy pig head? Uncle <laughs> Joe. Kate, if you let me be Santa Claus, I'll promise you a big, fat gobbler for Christmas dinner. You're always here for Christmas dinner. Anybody <laughs> care for some fresh milk? Uncle Joe, take this up and put it in the icebox. We'll decide about Santa Claus later. You can decide all you want, but I'm it. You got the padding for it, but it's on the wrong side. Please, boys, let's get busy stringing up these lights on the train, huh? Where are the bulbs, Floyd? They're in the baggage car. See, when you don't yell at me, I can remember. <laughs> Joe, you be careful up there. There's someone coming on a hand car from Hooterville. Hand car? Who is it? I can't tell for sure. It looks like Mr. Bedlow. Kate, Kate, look who's popping up the track to spend Christmas with us. My old buddy, Horror Bedlow. You see, Charlie, that was Mr. Bedlow we passed up at the Hooterville station. Oh, fine. <laughs> with that and pumping 20 miles on a hand car, he's going to be in a jolly mood. Just leave him to me. I don't need no help to handle Bedlow. Hey, what do you think you're doing in the property of the CNFW Railroad? We're decorating it for the annual Christmas carol sing, Mr. Bedlow. We go all the way across the valley singing and distributing gifts and baskets of food. It's a tradition, Mr. Bedlow. It was a tradition. Now start taking down those lights. Why? Violation of the CNFW rules and regulations. Well, how's old Homer Bedlow? Still looking for a way to get even with us for outsmarting you? No, not anymore. Ah, that's the Christmas spirit. Put her there. Christmas present for me? <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have done it. That's a legal writ empowering me to seize and hold this train. Oh, you, you shouldn't have done it. <laughs> hey! Sam! You being an educated city man and all, uh, Bobby Joe thought you'd uh, like to hear that beautiful song in Latin. Very nice. Lovely voice, that girl. She might be able to support you after the hotel's closed down, now that the train's gone. You mean Betty, Joe, and Floyd got it away? Oh, no. You don't steal that train on me anymore. Even that clever little engineer daughter of yours can't run the cannonball without this throttle lever. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bedlow, you certainly are a brilliant man. <laughs> Billy Joe, more fruitcake for Mr. Bedlow. Uncle Joe, more eggnog. Herbie, hurry with Mr. Bedlow's shoes. Charlie, give Mr. Bedlow a cigar. Bobby Joe, let's sing another Christmas carol for Mr. Bedlow, this time in English. <laughs> Pilot 
just returned from flying Mr. Bedlow to Hooterville, and he wanted to know if he'd be needing the plane. No, no, tell him to put... Hooterville? Bedlow went there? Yes, sir. He's going to inspect a cannonball. And he can find a thousand infractions. He is going to spoil Christmas for all those wonderful people. That mean, vengeful... Scrooge, sir? That's too good for Bedlow. <laughs> you be needing the plane then, sir? No, the helicopter. I've got to land close to Shady Rest if I'm going to stop him in time. and hand on his railroad. <laughs> oh, boy. That's all we need now. Nutty Norman, the hobo. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Carson. You remember me, Norman Curtis? Yeah, that's the way I remember you with your hand out. Hungry as usual, I suppose. <laughs> well, I cut you some food, but first, do you have a Homer Bedlow here, the CNFW Railroad? Yeah. If you're looking for him to give you a job, you're out of luck. That guy's the original Mr. Mean. What has he done? He grabbed the train, that's all. It's the end of the Hooterville Cannonball, the end of Shady Rest, and it's the end of your free handouts. Well, I'd like to talk to him alone. Send him in, will you? Can't you get it through your nutty noggin? Mr. Bedlow's a big shot. He ain't about to waste his time talking to a hobo. You tell him Norman P. Curtis wants him. He'll talk to me. Uncle, you hurry up with Mr. Bedlow's... Norman Curtis. Merry Christmas, Kate. Well, I I'm afraid this one isn't going to be a very merry one for us, but you get washed up, and we can at least give you one good hot meal before we close down. You got it, Mr. Bedlow. Oh, now it's Christmas Eve. I don't want to burden you with our troubles. From the looks of you, you got plenty of your own. Carson! Where's that engine? Coming right up, Mr. Bedlow, sir. I was delayed by this hobo coming to the door. Hobo? Bumming rides in a CNFW railroad, well? No, no, sir, Mr. Bedlow. Well, see that you don't, buddy, because I'm... <laughs> I'm sick. <laughs> Too much eggnog. I was afraid of that. I'll go get the bicarbonate. Uh, Kate, if you two will leave me alone with Mr. Bedlow, I think I know just how to straighten him out. <laughs> That's right, Kate. If anybody knows how to take care of a drunk, it's a hobo. <laughs> All right, everybody, we can get started now. Here comes Santa Claus. <laughs> Thank goodness that argument between Charlie and Joe got settled with no bloodshed. Yeah, that's the best Santa Claus ever. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Be jolly, Bedlow. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Jollier. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And a uh, Happy New Year. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs>
the one horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. been a Filmways presentation. Come and listen to my story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food, and up through the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold, Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. The Beverly Hillbillies. Come along and visit with the Clampett family As they take you to their mansion in the hills of Beverly And when they do, you'll run into a friend of theirs you've met That good old friend with filter blend Winston Cigarette Winston tastes good like a cigarette should That's fine right there, Mr. Brewster Get through! You can start bringing them things out now. Oh, boy, I can't wait to get back to California. I ain't been warm clean through since we got here. <laughs> get through. Take it easy. <laughs> We've been sleeping on a hard floor. It'd be awful nice to get in the warm bed for a change. I'll take it, Death Row. Get through. I said take it easy. Granny ready? Yeah, she's just putting on her gator. I'll bring it right out. Well, I hope you'll come visit us in California. We'd be mighty glad to see you, especially Pearl. Her and Jeff Reed coming to stay with us. Let me get my shoe on, you big overgrown moose. You can put it on in the car, Granny. We's in a hurry. We can't leave until somebody finds Ellie Mae. Where is she? She took to the woods early this morning with those two timber wolves that she's let sleep under her bed. Yeah, I'll find her. My doggie, it's a good thing we're leaving. One more night and she'd be baying at the moon. <laughs> Now, you two rascals have got to stay away from Maggie and her family, you hear me? Is it a deal? All right. Now, don't you forget it. You've seen them, Maggie. Give their word. What's more, Rita's going to keep an eagle eye on them. And if they goes to pestering you, she's going to snatch them both. Ain't you, Frida? <laughs> I wish you could come to Beverly Hills and live with us. But I reckon it'd be too long a trip for you and your youngins. But I'll come back and see you in the spring. Hey, me. Over here, Pa. You got them wolves with you? Oh, well, they won't pester you none. And that no biting promise goes for my Pa, too. <laughs> Hello there, Maggie. Hey, honey. Mr. Brewster's waiting, and we got to pick up Pearl and Jess Reen and drive clean to the airport. St. Pearl and Mr. Brewster are getting married? Well, no, not yet. Uh, maybe never. But Pearl's satisfied. Everybody in town seen him propose to her. Now she can leave town with her chin up and her head thrown back, proud and happy. I'll bet you Cousin Jess Reen ain't happy. She says she ain't going to California and leave her sweetie Jazz Boat a pew. She's powerful in love with that little feller. Yeah, I reckon Jethreen will do pretty much what her ma tells her to. 
Pearl's a mighty strong-willed woman. Just means for new time for them to pick us up. Now, no more sulking. You're coming to California. I don't want to hear no more argument about it. Okay, Ma. I'm coming. <laughs> the world have you got there? It's a trunk, Ma. Well, I can see that, but what you got in it? Well, I got some clothes and some shoes and, and some food and some water. I forgot the water. <laughs> water, why do you... <laughs> Miss Bodine, that daughter of yours is a mighty strong-willed girl. Oh, Did she put you in later? I think so. I told her I couldn't go to California with her. And that's the last thing I remember. Oh, don't let him get away. Jim Green, you put him down. This minute. What's the matter with you? Why, that poor boy could suffocate in that trunk without no air. <laughs> Jethreen, am I gonna have to take a switch to you? Jethreen, honey, like I told you, I can't just pick up and go. I got a big business going here. Well, couldn't you be a traveling salesman in California? <laughs> Darling, it's taken me years to build up this territory. And this is my big selling season. Why, well, I can knock down a hundred dollars in the next two or three months. And the fella don't walk away from a gold mine like that. Smoking <laughs> sense, Jethreen. But Uncle Jed's a millionaire, and Cousin Ellis says they got plenty of room in that mansion. He could stay there with us. Yes, the rain. I got my pride. Well, I'd rather die than take charity from my sweetheart's kinfolks. Oh, what's your, you can write to one another. Of course. And I'll be here when you get back. Oh, there they are. Now, Jeffrey, you get ready to leave. Mr. Brewster, I thought it was my boy Jethro, Cousin Jed, come to pick up the suitcase. Well, no, I, I asked him to let me come for them. I, well, you see, this, uh, this may be my last chance to see you alone for a moment. Alone? You, you, me, us? Well, why would you? Well, first, I want to thank you for publicly breaking our engagement after I lost my head as I did last night. Oh, shut. I, I didn't mean it when I said yes. It was just nerves and the excitement of the moment. Well, you were very sweet about yeah, it. Yeah, well, well, but now that my head is clear and I'm thinking straight, well, I realize I couldn't get married right yeah. now. Well, some man would lose a wonderful wife. My goodness, I got, I got family obligations, you know. Why, Cousin Jed's been after me three or four months to come to Beverly Hills and get that wild daughter of his proper dress and acting like a lady. I'm going to miss you, Mrs. Bodine. Yes, well, he's in desperate need of me. I don't know what come over me last evening, but now that I had a good night's sleep in the morning coffee, got my wits together, well, I could just laugh at myself for, for even considering marriage. Uh, Mrs. Bodine, I... I just want to say that I think you're a splendid woman, and I'm sure our paths will cross again. And Well, I'd consider it a, a great honor if you'd allow me to kiss you goodbye. Kiss me? me. Well, I hardly think there'd be anything wrong with that. Is that Miss Brewster? Is that a new Annie Pearl? <laughs> oh, my Ellie Mae, look, uh, Jeffrey's in there saying goodbye to her sweetie, Jasbo Depew. So, why don't you go in and say goodbye to him, too? Huh? All right. I ain't never met him. Jethreen, you're just going to have to get it through your head. I cannot go to California, and that's that. Howdy. Well, hi, Cousin Ellie. This here's my sweetie, Jasbo to Pew. Howdy, Jasbo. And a great big howdy to you. <laughs> this girl is the cousin you've been telling me about? Yeah, Jasbo. She's the one we'll be staying with in California. Well, poke me another air hole, baby, and let's go. <laughs> ¶¶ 
I just had a call from Brewster and Tulsa. The Clampets are on their way home. Jethro? Oh, I mean the Clampets. <laughs> yes, and they're bringing a cousin and her daughter along. That'll be six of them. I think I'd better order an extra limousine. Chief, if I may suggest, the personal touch is very important to these people, and they are the bank's largest depositors. I would be happy to volunteer my car and myself. I can take at least half the load. Jethro. <laughs> <laughs> and the luggage. See, Chief. I have bucket seats, and Jethro is quite a bucketful. <laughs> How's about three apiece, Chief? Fine. We'll be ready to leave the airport about noon. Entendu, mon capitaine. Time to leave for the airport, Miss Hathaway. Right. Don't be alarmed, Chief. This is just for the Clampets. I have no intention of disrupting office discipline with my seductive appearance. What a remarkable change. Three hours in the beauty salon. Tell me, are you busy tonight? <laughs> because if you're not, I'd like you to work and make up those three hours. <laughs> They could have missed the plane. Oh, impossible. Brewster phoned me after he put him on board. Uh, oh, miss, uh, are there any more passengers aboard? Yes, there are uh, six. Well, they appear to be um, hillbillies. Was there anything wrong with them? Oh, no. You see, we served lunch before we arrived, and they refused to leave the plane until they helped do the dishes. <laughs> and we served 120 lunches. <laughs> well, here they come. Flight 201 for Chicago and New York is now loading at the East Concourse. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your food with us. And thank you for doing the dishes. You sure you don't want us to wash the windows? It won't take long if we all pitch in. <laughs> thank you. Drysdale, howdy. Welcome home, Mr. Clampett. This here is my cousin, Pearl Bodie. Oh, uh, howdy, Mr. Drysdale. Oh, <laughs> excuse my wet hand. Oh, it's quite all right. Well, how did you enjoy your plane ride? I don't believe it. Ah, uh, plain don't believe it. It's a miracle. <laughs> oh, well, it ain't nothing. You ain't seen nothing, Pearl. Wait till we ride on that escalator. Yes. Well, my car's out in front, Mr. Clavitt. Come on. <laughs> Mon amour. <laughs> that ain't my name. <laughs> Who are you? I am a wild. They're mysterious gypsies. <laughs> I've come to take you away to my gypsy camp. <laughs> you got some food there? <laughs> well, I can't stay long, but I am kind of hungry. <laughs> Help and wash all them dishes. Give me quite an appetite. <laughs> Jet! Them stairs, he's moving. We're having a California earthquake. Uh, Pearl, them stairs are supposed to move like that. What for? I don't know, but uh, that's what they call an escalator. Only thing is, last time we was here, they was moving the other way. <laughs> come on. Well, we ain't going to get on them crazy stairs. Oh, come on, Pearl. Once you're on there, you like it. Oh! <laughs> Welcome home, Ellie Mae. Howdy, Mr. Drysdale. <laughs> Welcome home, Granny. Thank you. Well, where's Jeff Reed? Last I saw of her, she was still eating. <laughs> well, now, that wasn't bad, was it? No, it was fun. Let's go up and ride down again. Oh, uh, no, Pearl. Uh, it's fun, all right, but it just ain't worth fighting your way back upstream. <laughs> This place is haunted. A ghost just went through that door. There ain't no ghost, Pearl. That's what they call an uh, electric eye. They got them all over out here. Well, you go first. I ain't taking no chances on crowding a spook. <laughs> So this is California. 
California. It's so warm. And the air smells different from the mountains. Yep, looks different, too. Out here, you can see what you're breathing. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot of body to it. I tell you, Pearl, there's some days when you can cut it with a knife. But don't try it, because it gets a knife awful smudgy. <laughs> we can wait here in Mr. Drydale's car until the rest of them come. I'll go with Martin and take the luggage around to the service entrance. I can't believe it. I've seen pictures, but I just can't believe it. It ain't real. It's real, Ma. <laughs> Jeff Green, don't you knock no holes in your Uncle Jed's mansion. Ah, uh, she can't hurt it, Pearl. Wait till you see inside, Pearl. It's the biggest bunch of indoors you ever did see. <laughs> <laughs> at the airport? <laughs> no, you got to climb those yourself. Come on, Jeffrey. I'll show you outside. Granny, how do you ever wash that thing? Ain't washed it yet, Pearl. Oh, well, don't you worry. I'll do it. <laughs> uh, Pearl, uh... Uh, now, this here is what they call the drawing room. Drawing. Wait till you see this piano. The whole thing is hand painted. Yeah, Pearl. Ain't that just about the prettiest piano you ever did see? It's got pictures on it. Hmm. Look at the dust. Granny, <laughs> <laughs> did you run up them curtains? No. They was here when we came. Well, as soon as we get settled, I'll run up some new ones. <laughs> and windows ain't been washed in weeks. Well, uh, Pearl, you know, it's a mighty big house. It'd take a miracle woman to get it all done. <laughs> Looks like I've come just in time, huh? <laughs> Where's the kitchen, Dad? I'll show you. <laughs> Thirty-two rooms in this house, and something tells me it ain't gonna be big enough. <laughs> Where's St. Pearl? Well, her and Granny's in that little room they call a butler's pantry. Well, this is a nice enough kitchen, Granny, but it sure ain't as big as you led me to believe. Pearl, this ain't the one with the stove. The stove is... <gasps> this here's the barest cupboard I ever did see, but I reckon if you ain't got a stove, you don't need food. Get out of this room. Well, Pearl, what do you think? Well, I think I should have brought my coal oil stove. <laughs> For your information, Miss Pearl, we got gas. Well, I don't wonder. Nothing but uncooked food. <laughs> you pump... It's... Tight, it ain't been used so long, Pearl. <laughs> no, Granny, we got a lot of work to do to get this kitchen in shape. Granny, did you tell Pearl this is a kitchen? I ain't been able to tell Pearl nothing. She won't quit flapping her trap long enough. <laughs> Pearl, come on. <laughs> this here's the kitchen. That there is what they call a pantry. My stars and God. <laughs> what? A person could feed an army in here. Well, the way those two young'uns of yours eat, that's just what you'll have to do. Uh, Pearl, uh, look at this stove here. All you have to do to get fire is uh, turn one of them little things right here without lighting no matches nor nothing. Now, look at here. This here lights this one here. And this one uh, lights this one. And this one lights this one here. And this one lights this one. Oh, what do you think of that, Pearl? I declare, I'm just speechless. That'll be the day. <laughs> oh, uh, look at this icebox here. Just take a look. You ever seen anything like that before? Look at that. Well, I don't like to mention it yet, but somebody left the light a-burning in there. <laughs> I reckon some people just don't care how they waste other people's money. The light comes on when you open the door. You don't say. He pert near didn't with you pounding your gums. <laughs> 
Emperor Jeffrey wants to know where's the suitcases, especially the big one with the sandwiches in it. <laughs> but Jethro said he'd bring in the suitcases. Jethro. What happened to my boy? Where's Jethro? Well, the last time I seen him, a dark-haired gypsy woman was a taking him away. <laughs> Gypsy's got him. My baby's been carried off by the gypsy. <laughs> oh, worry, Pearl. One meal and they'll carry him right back. <laughs> I have a little bit mixed up. Besides, Jethro is big enough to take care of himself. Yeah, my mom's in here. Oh, Come on in. My baby, where you been? With the gypsy woman? We stopped to get something to eat. I told you one meal and they'd bring him back. <laughs> you gypsy kidnapper. I'm gonna snatch you both! Get out of the way! What you doing being a gypsy? Just a little harmless fun, Mr. Clampett. When Jethro failed to recognize me, I couldn't resist continuing the masquerade. Uh, Ma, this here's Miss Hathaway, Mr. Drysdale's secretary. I'm happy to know you, Mrs. Botine. I have brought your son back safe and sound. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Is your hair back? <laughs> How much staying for supper, Miss Hathaway? Oh, I wouldn't want to be any trouble. Well, I figured with company to table, there wouldn't be so much trouble. Well, you taste great as sweet potato pie. Ain't nobody can make sweet potato pie like my ma. Now, they is both very fine, extra good cooks, but uh, Pearl not knowing her way around the kitchen, I reckon... Oh, that... well, don't you worry none about that, Jed. I'll have this kitchen put in order in no time. It ain't out of order. Millie, you get rid of the ants. I'll start the cooking. What ants? Start with your Aunt Pearl. <laughs> well, I like that. I'll bet you you won't like what I'm going to say next. Uh, girls, I got an idea. Now, Pearl, you know they ain't nothing more soothing and appetizing than a mess of piano playing and sweet singing for supper. But I figure a body can't be doing that and cooking at the same time. No, I don't think they hardly could, Jeff. Right. Now, somebody will get Mr. Drysdale... We'll all sit around while supper's cooking and listen to the kind of music that has made the name of Bodine famous from Oxford to Eureka Spring. <laughs> supper time. Want me to start setting the table? Yeah, and let's use that big company table in the fancy eating room. Okay, Paul. Uh, you help me get the chairs around it? Why, sure. Leave the door open so as we can hear the music. Okay, Pa. I'm kind of glad we got company so we can show off this fine eating table. Yeah, we ain't used it since Thanksgiving. Has Granny figured out a way to get this tablecloth unstuck yet? No, she ain't, Pa. She even tried to steam it off. <laughs> she couldn't get it loose. She said if she didn't know better, she'd think somebody stuck it down on purpose. <laughs> well, I'm glad I got all my pot passers notched. They come in real handy. See? You find out there if you want, you can uh, reach for it and get it or pass it without bothering the fellow sitting next to you. Yeah, the good thing about this table is things can't go a sliding off. Oh, I gotta tell Granny. Since we're gonna use this table, she can leave the vittles right in the pots. No, he's he pearl getting fancy. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Ever see anybody bake a fluffier pie than that one? <laughs> Some folks don't know that cakes is fluffy and pies is juicy. <laughs> it fell. You did that on purpose, Pearl Bodine. <laughs> I can't fall. It can't, huh? <laughs> Just did. Granny! Pearl, like you, I ain't never heard you, you play the piano any prettier than you're a plane that right. <laughs> you ain't playing the piano. You betcha I ain't!
feel the same way, Jethrine. <laughs> Dry Dale, have I got enough money to take everybody out to a nice eating place? Mr. Clampett, with your money, you can buy the finest restaurant in Beverly Hills. Before the battle's over, that's just what I might have to do. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Sit down to the piano, Jeffrey, and play us some nice, pretty after-supper music. All right, Uncle Jay. Have a Winston, Mr. Clavin? Well, doggies, it's putting the Winston in gold packages now. <laughs> What's that D stand for? Delicious? No, Drysdale. You see, that's my own personal cigarette case. Well, now, ain't that something? I'd be pleased to make you a present of one of those, if you like it. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Drysdale, but I reckon Winston tastes just as good, whether it's wrapped in gold or the regular package. That's true. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. That's mighty pretty, Jeff. Reen, play that again. Sure. <laughs> the Beverly Hillbillies has been presented by Winston. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we hope you will try Winston, because Winston tastes good, like a cigarette should. <laughs> Now it's time to say goodbye to Jed and all his kin. And they would like to thank you folks for kindly dropping in. You're all invited back next week to this locality to have a heapin' helpin' of their hospitality. Hillbilly, that is. Set a spell. Take your shoes off. You all come back now, here. This has been a Filmways presentation. Come ride the little train that is rolling down the tracks to the junction. Forget about your cares, it is time to relax at the junction. Lots of curves, you bet, and even more when you get to the junction. Petticoat Junction. There's a little hotel called the Shady Rest at the junction. Petticoat Junction. It is run by Kate. Come and be her guest at the junction. Petticoat Junction. And that's Uncle Joe. He's a moving kind of slow at the junction. Petticoat Junction. Obliged, Kate. Pick you up soon as we turn around, Kate. Well, that'll be fine, Charlie. Make it exactly 20 minutes to maybe an hour from now. <laughs> oh, well, right on the dot. <laughs> Anywhere in there. So long, Kate. See you later. Bye, bye. Boy. See you later. Bye bye, Floyd. Hi, Charlie. Morning, Kate. Oh, hi, Girls, Dad. Dad. How are you? You come in for the special sale on woolen mufflers? Oh, I didn't know you were having a sale. Is that what you're hanging the flag up for? Oh, no, Kate. Hey, Herbie, bring me that screwdriver. No, this is a service flag. Had it in stock since 18. I figure when my only employee goes in service, I ought to make something over it. You mean Herbie? Yeah, he's been drafted. Leaves tomorrow. Tomorrow? No fooling. How does he feel about it? Well, he, uh... <laughs> that answer your question? <laughs> I've seen half-starved hound dogs look happier than that. Yeah, Herbie's all heart. Yeah, but he's not the kind to want to shirk his duty. Oh, of course not. He's upset over leaving his hometown. He thinks nobody cares. But that's not true. Of course it isn't. It could be Herbie's got a point. Not too many people even know he's here. Yeah, I know what you mean. 
For a boy six feet tall, he sure throws a mighty short shadow. Not enough shade for a hot frog. <laughs> Poor boy. You're the one he's really going to hate to say goodbye to, Billy Joe. You know how he feels about you. Well, sure, but what Come am on, I going to do? Let's go inside and cheer up Herbie. Especially you, Billy Joe. Herbie, congratulations. We just heard the news. What happened? The draft board changed its mind? <laughs> I mean, congratulations about being called into service. Oh. Well, everyone in Hooda feels sorry to see you go, Herbie. But we're sure proud of you. Huh? We'll miss you. But our hearts will be with you. They will? Not only are the people around here going to miss you, but they're going to sit up and take notice when they see you in uniform. Yeah? Nah. Even in uniform, I'm still me. Oh, Herbie, you're going to be dreamy in the uniform. I just know it. Gosh, you really think so, Billy Joe? Oh, do I ever. Well, gosh, I mean, golly. Isn't it exciting going into service, Herbie? It's getting to be. Sure. Of course it is, Herbie. Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, hi, hi Junior. Junior. Hello there, Billy Joe. Hi, Junior. Have you heard the good news? It's the biggest event since the opening of the store. You having a sale? Uh, yeah, on wool and mufflers. But listen to this. Herbie's going into the service. Hey, that is a big event. I, I could use a new muffler. You got any uh, red ones? Junior, the big event is Herbie going into the service. Oh, come on. What's so big about Herbie becoming a dog-faced private? Is that what I'm going to be? A dog-faced private? Of course not. Well, what am I going to be? Anything you want to be. Right, girls? Sure. I'll bet you could even be an officer, say, in the Marines. Or a jet pilot in the Air Force. Or a submarine commander. Or one of those um, uh, astronauts. Hey, that's a good idea. I sort of like them fancy-looking spacesuits. Maybe I'll become an astronaut. Hey, you got a head start, Herbie. You're practically weightless. <laughs> sure. Being thin can have its advantages. You might be the first man to reach the moon. Are you kidding? Herbie can't even reach for the pork and beans, lest Mr. Drucker points it out to him. Junior, don't be jealous. Je je of Herbie? Herbie couldn't even read the physical requirements to be an astronaut, let alone pass them. Oh, well, he passed the physical requirements to play football for the Hooterville Hornets. So there. Oh, big deal. Herbie Bates, the all-time leading yardage loser of the all-time scoreless wonders. Well, it, it's a record. Herbie, can't you see they're putting you on? On what? Oh, Bates, you're beautiful. You're, you're really beautiful. What do you mean? Well, what he means is that, that you're handsome and you're going to be even more handsome in uniform. Well, so long, Junior. It was nice seeing you. Hey, wait a minute. I haven't done my shopping yet. This I is on the house. Well, what's going on here? I... Star football player you got with you? Hi, Herbie. Hi there, Coach. What are you doing here? Playing hooky from Drucker's store? He's the guest of honor at the party we're throwing for him tonight. Herbie's going in the service tomorrow, Uncle Joe. I'm becoming an astronaut. Well, congrat. A what? An astronaut, Uncle Joe. Herbie? <laughs> Stop joshing me. Come on, joshing? I'm putting in with them missile flying fellas. <laughs> with John Glenn going into politics. That leaves a place open for Herbie. <laughs> Come on, girls. Uh, Herbie. Hey. Herbie going to be an astronaut. It's laughable. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't it? Mom doesn't think so. Or Billy, or Bobby, or Mr. Drucker. Even Junior Hawker wasn't able to laugh about it. <laughs> See, if he was to become an astronaut, he'd be the most famous person ever to come out of Hooterville, wouldn't he? No doubt about it. See, you know a shrewd manager could push him into politics after he gets out and make another John Glenn out of him. Uncle Joe. I might put my brain behind Herbie, give him something to fall back on. <laughs> yes, sir, that boy's okay. He's a real comer. You... <laughs> Hello, 
Albert. Welcome to Shady Red. Uh, Hello, you old time burner. Night, huh? <laughs> Sam, yeah, how's everything in Hooterville? Hey, what are you doing here, party smasher? Uh, I heard Miss Bradley say everybody was welcome. Well, that don't include you, wise guy. Relax, Herbie. You'll have Billy Joe all to yourself. I will? Sure. Whenever she's not busy dancing with me. Hey, that ain't fair. <laughs> Listen, you stay away from Billy Joe. This is my last but, night with you. Hey, you want to come get some punch with me, Herbie? No, 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 Billy. Herbie and me want to have a talk about his future. Come on. I'll get some with you, Billy Joe. But I can, wait a minute. I'd like to get some punch with you. Ain't that great, Herbie? I know. I made it myself. I don't care. I'm going to get me some with Billy Joe. I knew a fellow once that felt the same way about cider. Good or bad, he couldn't leave his stuff alone. <laughs> for a fact, for a fact. Oh, gee, that's cute. I don't think anything a slacker says is particular cute. Don't talk stupid, Bates. <laughs> Junior's not a slacker, Herbie. I don't see him offering his services to his country. I'm deferred till I get out of college. Then I'm going into officer's training school. See, he admits it. He's going to stay home and become a policeman. <laughs> I'm becoming an officer in the army, you dope. Oh, I kind. Uh, boys, if we're going to argue, I'm going to have to break this up. Herbie, maybe you and I better go for a walk. Uh, no, no, we won't argue anymore. Oh, yes, we will. Now let's walk. <laughs> seen Hooterville's hottest vote getter? Hooterville's who? You know, Mom, Uncle Joe's political protege, Herbie Bates. He's the John Glenn of our town, otherwise known as Orbitin Herbie Bates. <laughs> Uncle Joe, why don't you stop bothering that boy? He'd like to spend a little time alone with Billy. Tonight's our only chance to map out his political career. It's also his only chance to say goodbye to Billy. He ain't got no time to waste on girls. He's saving all his sweet talk for the voters and his kisses for their babies. <laughs> well, there goes the last of the big-time political bosses. I may be going real far away, Billy Joe. I know. Oh, but all right, T, I promise. You won't be running around with that slacker Junior Hawker all the time, will you? Oh, not all the time. I promise. Do you want to seal it with a kiss? Do you? Golly, do I ever. Hey, Herbie. <laughs> Been looking all over for you. I want to talk to you. I can't wait. Please, Mr. Carson. You can see him later, Uncle Joe. Nope, I got to see him tonight. Uh, Billy Joe, why don't you go in and join the guests while Herbie and me discuss his destiny? Well... If I can't sit here quiet and peaceful, I want to dance. Me too. Wait a minute, son. You got to start thinking of your future. That's what I'm thinking about. As soon as Billy goes inside, Junior's going to glom onto her. Oh, hold on, son. If you want to get someplace with Billy, you ain't going to do it dancing. Oh, you, you see me dance, huh? Well, that's not what I mean. Relax and rock for a minute. I'll tell you how you can win over everybody in these parts. Including Billy Joe. You mean it? It's a cinch. With me guiding your destiny, there ain't no reason why you couldn't become even more popular than Johnny Glenn, Gordo Cooper. Yeah, astronauts sure do become famous. And how? Well, you could even be one of the first ones on the moon. Billy Joe ain't about to forget you with your name splashed all over the papers. Yeah, I reckon not. It's only a short jump from the moon to the state capitol. State capitol? You come home a famous astronaut, pushing you right into politics. Politics? Yeah, Billy Joe cheering you onward and upward, just like everybody else. Junior Hawker would sure have to go something to beat that. Yeah, so would some of them other young punks traipsing around after Billy. Golly, Mr. Carson. I can't think of anything I'd rather do than having Billy Joe look up to me. If becoming an astronaut is what it takes to make Billy Joe forget Herbie. about everybody else, then that's what I'm going to do. Well, I'm going to go down to... <laughs> Mr. Carson? There's nothing makes me edgier than somebody rocking against me. <laughs> now, will you learn how to rock, or I'm pulling my brains out of this deal? <laughs> Sorry, sir. Now, between flights and the missile, get in some good rocking practice, will you? Yes, sir. I certainly will. Good boy. Now, let's go in and hit him with our speech. Speech? I ain't no public speaker. Herbie, my boy, with me behind you, you can do anything. 
All right, everybody's quiet. Now, tell us what's on your mind, Herbie. Thank you, Mrs. Bradley. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I'd still like to take this opportunity to thank you all for coming to my party, especially Mrs. Bradley for throwing it for me. Also want to make an announcement about my military career. <laughs> also want to make an announcement about my military career. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, when they swear me in, they won't be swearing in any dog face. They'll be swearing in a rip-snorting terrier. <laughs> me. Ah, <laughs> uh, I hereby announce that I'm becoming America's newest... Astronaut stupid. Astronaut stupid. <laughs> no, no, just plain astronaut. <laughs> Uh, after a couple of trips around the moon and back uh, with my buddies like Johnny Glenn and Gordon Cooper, uh, I'm coming home and throwing my space helmet in the political ring. Any questions you want answered about me while I'm gone? Any questions you want answered about me while I'm gone? Just check with that public-spirited citizen, genial Joe Carson. Just check with that public-spirited citizen, genial Joe Carson. I thank you. I thank you. Hello, Kate. Well, genial Joe, you just helped that boy make a fool of himself. Kate, you keep proving over and over that women and politics don't mix. We never should have given you the vote. With you and Herbie in politics, we may give it back. <laughs> Walked all the way back from the army camp, 40 miles through brush so no one would see me. Well, sit down before you faint and fall in it. Oh, is anybody around here? Everybody's asleep, except Billy Joe. She's writing you another letter. But what happened? Well, after six days in the service, they up and kicked me out. Why? Well, it seems like I got what they call a trick knee. They said it probably came from playing football. And they said I also got a bad back, also probably from playing football. Anyway, after putting near a week of tests and x-rays, they decided to give me a medical discharge. Oh, that's a shame, Herbie. But you've always got your job at Drucker's to go back to. Oh, I ain't going back there, Mrs. Bradley. I have to be popping off the way I did before I left. I ain't ever going to be able to face anybody again. Especially Billy Joe. Oh, I sure made a fool of myself. With some strong assistance from genial Joe. Will you hide me here till morning? Of course, Herbie, but why? Then I'll disappear. I'll take off for some foreign place like the Casbah or Cleveland or something. <laughs> now stop talking, silly. If you're bent on hiding, I'll stash you in the attic till we can figure out some way of bringing you back from the service proper like. Then you won't tell Billy Joe what a flop I am? Oh, no, of course not. Come on, let's go up to the attic. It isn't very comfortable, but then I'm afraid you have no choice. You either have to be honest or uncomfortable. <laughs> What a shame. Herbie sure came a cropper, didn't he? Yeah. Poor boy's hiding up in my attic. But his spirits is down in the cellar. <laughs> Too bad you had to sneak in here at night to tell me about it, Kate. Well, I wish I could think of some way to help you, but my mind's all full of newspaper business right now. Well, Sam, the, the truth of the matter is, I wanted to catch you before you went to press with the Hooterville World Guardian. Kate figures the paper can help Herbie out of the mess he's in. When people read things in black and white, they're more likely to believe it. You know that, Sam. Now, wait a minute, Kate. As owner, editor, and publisher of Hooterville's only newspaper, and a man who's never deviated from the truth, you don't expect me to write a story to cover up for a bungling youth, do you? No, Sam. I'll write the story. That's different. <laughs> I'd be proud to print anything you write, Kate. I'll set the type. Hey, how about me doing something? Okay, you can do our proofreading. If it's all the same with you, I think I'd be better at proof listening. <laughs> yep, the strategy I got planned for Herbie it won't be long with either way up there. 
Your strategy already has him way up there. Well, he ain't an astronaut yet. He's got to go through a period of training first. Earl, your mother's a fine woman, but her understanding of military service and politics is pathetic. <laughs> extra, extra, read all about it. Local hero what returns. Got there? What got there? Well, What's all the excitement, yeah. Charlie? Herbie's coming home. No. Yeah, for a fact. Well, look, everybody. Our Herbie returns. Herbie Bates, the popular young Hooterville resident who recently applied for duty in the armed services as an astronaut, received a medical discharge and is returning to Hooterville. The cause of his injury is not disclosed due to the classified nature of his assignment. <laughs> huh. You suppose it's true? What do you mean, you suppose? There it is in black and white. Well, yes, I know, but sometimes Kate, newspaper... Now there's another thing you've proven you don't know anything about. The newspaper game. Well, I guess you're right, Uncle Joe. <laughs> it says here he'll be home tomorrow. Why don't we arrange for a homecoming celebration for him? Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's a good idea, Charlie. Say, I'll make a banner for the side of the train. Hero special or something. Uncle Joe, don't ruin another one of my good sheets by painting on it. Yeah, but Kate... Well, okay. This time it's worth it. I wonder how bad Herbie was hurt. Well, I don't know, but a great career was nipped in the bud. <laughs> My poor Herbie. There goes the governor's seat right down the drain. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Bradley. Hi. Boy, your room sure is a lot nicer than the attic. Thanks. Now, the next stage is to get you down and sneak you onto that train when it pulls in. I'm going to get out of these jeans and into a nice dress for Herbie's homecoming. Okay. I'm going to take my bath now. There's going to be more eyes in that hallway than in a sack of potatoes. I got to do something to you. What are you fixing on doing? Huh. With Bobby's dress and Billy's coat and... Betty Joe's wig from the school play and my fur piece, we might get away with it. Come on. Oh, who's that? <laughs> Herbie, it's you. Hey, ain't a bad looker, huh? Come on, gorgeous. <laughs> bothering me. What's that, dear? Well, that girl over there, do you know who she is? <laughs> oh, probably a friend of Herbie's. Well, I don't like her. Now, why do you say that? For one thing, she's got a coat on, just like my new one. For another thing, look how snooty she is standing over there by herself. Oh, well, no, never mind her. Here comes the cannonball with Herbie. Look, dear, look. Look no at the train. good, Herbie Bates. <laughs> what, what? He no sooner gets a uniform on than, than he has to go take up with that hussy. Oh, that's what you think. Good. I mean, it is good to think that way. Uh, uh, watch the train, dear. I've been riding to him for six whole days, and I haven't even looked at another boy. At least not for very long. And he has to go and do that to me. Pipe down, will you, Billy? You know, I had to go there and scratch your eyes out that, that man-stealer. Oh, Billy. <laughs> Could I have your attention, please? This is the moment uh, we've all been waiting for. The triumphant return of our own Herbie Bates. We take this opportunity to welcome him home from a short but distinguished career in the military service. <laughs> Get 
himself together a little slowly, folks. Is he busted up bad? Well, not too bad, uh, but he don't quite look like his old self. <laughs> look at his lips. There's lipstick all over him. Oh, that hussy, she sneaked on the train and she kissed him. Where is she? I'm going to kill her. For heaven's sakes, quiet down, Scarlett O'Hara. Thank you, folks. I'm glad to be home, and I'm fixing to go back to work at Mr. Drucker's store real soon. Right, Herbie. Uh, now, folks, let's all go up to Kate's for coffee and donuts. Oh, Herbie, my wonderful darling Herbie. You what? Oh, promise me you'll never look at that hussy again. Here, let me wipe her lipstick off of you. What? <laughs> There, that's better. Now, here's some of mine. Golly, Billy Joe. Well, golly. What that? Well, the nerve of that hussy. She even wears my shade of lipstick. Golly. Come on, I'm not letting you out of my sight. Going back to Drucker's store. I knew that kid was a loser. Doesn't look like one right now to me. Hey, Junior, you ever give any thought to using a military career as a springboard into politics? I'm not interested in politics, Mr. Carson. Kate, you're looking at a frustrated man with a great brain and no way of making it pay off. Yes, Uncle Jim. Stuck out here in the middle of nowhere with nothing but losers. Yes, Uncle Joe. Ain't it a cotton-picking shame? been a Filmways presentation. Come and listen to my story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food, and up through the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold, Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. The Beverly Hillbillies. Come along and visit with the Clampett family As they learn the simple pleasures of the hills of Beverly and That includes the products of your sponsor of the week The cereals of Kellogg's, Kellogg's of Battle Creek K-E-L-L-O-Double-Good, Kellogg's best to you Ma's done give us breakfast already, Granny. And now she's got us cleaning the house from top to bottom. How come no one woke me? Well, she says we ain't supposed to wake you. That's how come she shut off your alarm clock. So Pearl done it. I'm sorry I took it out on you, clock. Yes, sir, your boss says bring you this bucket of suds. Oh, good morning, Granny. How's your rheumatism? What rheumatism? Well, Pearl says you was having some twinges last night. Uh, that's how come she 
put a little Mountain Dew into your squirrel soup? <laughs> Pearl spiked my soup? <laughs> well, yeah, she figured it would uh, help you to sleep. And you was liking it too, Granny. You kept asking for another slug of soup. <laughs> well, that, that's because I couldn't believe that Pearl could make such good soup. Granny, what are you doing up? Ain't Pearl said I was to give you your breakfast in bed. Beds is for sleeping, not eating. Well, ain't Pearl said a body had to be waited on and took care of when it gets to be your age. My age? Well, I'm in the prime of life. And you tell your Aunt Pearl that... Never mind, I'll tell her myself. Ah, don't get riled up at Pearl. I reckon she's just trying to be helpful. She's about as helpful as an alligator in a swimming hole. <laughs> I'd rather be caught twixt a pair of scrapping bobcats and two women trying to run the same house. <laughs> Granny, I was just fetching this up to your room. Ma figured you'd probably want to set and rock a spell when you was feeling strong enough to get out of bed. Aunt Green, you take that back outside. And while you're at it, you fetch some flowers for your Ma's sick room. Ma ain't sick. Hey, she ain't met up with me yet. Where is she? In the kitchen doing the ironing. Ironing? I ain't done the washing yet. Ma done that while you were still in bed. All by herself? Oh, no. She had all of us helping. Ma gets a kick out of running things. She's going to get a kick that she ain't looking for. I want to boot her so hard that every time she sets down, she'll leave my footprints. Takes a lot. With all these newfangled gadgets, work around here is just plain. Where are you going with that, Jeffrey? Outside. I told you to take it up to Granny's bedroom. Granny told me to take it outside. You're taking your orders from me and not from Granny. <laughs> That poor woman is old and tired, and we owe it to her to let her rest. <laughs> Just hope and pray when I get to be her age that somebody will be looking after me. <laughs> you can quit hoping and praying. And if you keep messing around my kitchen, you ain't going to get to be my age. <laughs> but don't stand there. Do as Granny says. Take it outside. <laughs> uh, how do you feel, Granny? Did you sleep off the suit? I mean, did the soup see, uh, did, did the soup help you to sleep? Now you listen to me, Pearl, and you listen good. When you was a baby and you needed it, I spanked you. And when you was a toddler, I paddled you. And when you was a young and I switched you. And I can still do it, Pearl. Besides, the target's a heap much bigger today. No, honey, don't be riled. I, you was looking poorly last night, and I figured you needed a little rest. Honest. You, you look like the dogs that had you under the porch. <laughs> you can't scare me with that. I got a head of steam bigger than it has. Gonna make pretty music when you make a check like this, Uncle Jed? Well, that ain't for playing with, Jethro. You bust that and your mall tan you good. Ma, I didn't watch the front of the house as high up as I can get. I'll need a ladder to get the whole thing. Well, I'm getting you to wash the hole outside the house? Yes, sir, she said, every inch of it. Well, if she ain't the cleanest woman. Oh, well, come on, I'll help you. Uh, Granny! Granny! Uh, uh, Granny! Granny, I'm holding on to you. You can hurt a body with a hard steel in my face. Oh! Uh, Jethro, protect your mom! How can Granny hurt your mom? You said she was too old to get out of bed. I don't know if you was too old to get out of bed. Oh, 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 she comes. Oh, 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 oh. some of the tempers in his family. Ain't Pearl. Ain't Cousin Jeff Raina coming? Oh, no, honey. She, she wants to practice her singing. She can go sightseeing another time. Oh, 
herself running off and leaving a child, that's it. Your brain ain't sick, she's singing. Well, she's singing sick. <laughs> for your information, my daughter's training for the stage. Well, now, that's one thing she can do, drive a stage. Ah, this snapping backbiting twixt you two has got to stop. Quick as Jethro gets here with the truck, We're going to take a nice long drive and show Pearl some amazing sights. She ain't never going to see no more amazing sights than she sees every morning when she looks in the mirror. <laughs> I wouldn't talk girl, if I was you. Junky Pop, Yenny comes a truck and there's nobody a driving it. <laughs> What's the trouble, Jethro? It's out of gas, Uncle Jed. They ain't even enough to get to the filling station. Yeah, I'll tell you what, sir. Let me, you run the house to get Granny's jug. The big one. Ooh! Don't tell me that child ain't sick. Nobody makes a noise like that on purpose. <laughs> You're gonna be sorry you said them things when Jeff Green commences singing with a big orchestra like Rudy Bell. <laughs> Ooh! Rudy Valley and his Connecticut Yankees. <laughs> Did you hear that, Jed? Your traitor cousin Pearl is letting her daughter desert to the Yankees. <laughs> I reckon they're getting what they deserve. <laughs> there you are, Pop. Thank you, Lemmy. <laughs> I get through. See if it'll start. Okay, Uncle Jed. Get through and me is going to get gas. We'll be right back. Uh, <laughs> Tell me, at school, there's lots of movie stars live on this street. Do you reckon that Francis X. Bushman lives in one of them houses? Wouldn't be a bit surprised. Oh, my stars and garters. If I was to meet him face to face, I'd faint that away. So would he. <laughs> What'd she say, Ellie? Well, she said... Look at that big house down there. I bet you there's a movie star lives in that one. Oh, Jethro, drive up the driveway, and I'll go to the door and ask for directions. A directions to where, Ma? Directions to the next corner. Who cares? <laughs> you didn't stop. Well, I know how to get to the next corner. <laughs> you know we passed it. Why, that might have been Raymond Navarro's house. I might have got acquainted with him and told him how I played piano at the movie theater back home. <laughs> Why, I could have played and sung the song I wrote for the chariot race in Ben-Hur. Slipper down, Pearl. I don't reckon that was Mr. Navarro's house. I got a good look up the driveway as we passed. The barn door was open. There wasn't a span of horses or a chariot in there. <laughs> well, slow down anyway, Jethro. Land sakes, if I was to see Rod LaRock or John Gilbert or Hoot Gibson, why, I wouldn't even have time to ask for their autograph. Some women is just plain man crazy. <laughs> What'd she say, Ellie? Well, she said so. Let's drive it. down to the business part of town, Jethro, and show Pearl some of the beautiful buildings and stores they got there. Okay, Uncle Jed. Tell your Aunt Pearl not to fret. They's been there, too. <laughs> Aunt Pearl, Granny said... Never mind, Allie. Drive on, Jethro. <laughs> I think we'll see some movie stars down there. Come in, folks, the movie's about to begin. By the way, the wax figures out front are by courtesy of the Beverly Hills Movie Museum. Sucky, ain't Pearl? There's the movie picture to you up yonder. Yeah. I wonder if they need a right good first-class piano player. <laughs> Why, do you know one? <laughs> Now, I have taken Say, all... Say, Pearl, my... <laughs> ain't there movie stars out in front of that theater? <laughs> Top of my Jethro. I can't believe it. It's Douglas Fairbanks, Rudolph Valentino, and William S. Hart. I have never seen one woman as man crazy and movie star crazy as William S. Hart. 
Let me off of here. Yes, sir. We'll drive on before we embarrass them poor fellers. Bill, honey, you're my hero. Yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo. Hey, hey. steely eyes just a staring at me. You betcha, Granny. Well, well, Rudolph Valentino kind of give me a scorcher of a look, too. He sure did, sir. <laughs> How about them green drawers that Mr. Fairbanks was wearing? <laughs> yeah, did. You ought to dye your drawers that color. <laughs> oh, Pearl, red's my color. <laughs> Hi, Jethro. Let's go for a swim. I'm too hungry, Ellie Mae. All that driving around, give me an appetite. Yeah, I reckon all that fresh air give us all an appetite. I empty his last year's bird's nest myself. Buddy, time too. I reckon I got time for a little friend before fiddle. Hurry up, Ellie Mae. I could eat a horse. Well, it's just, just everybody relax. I'll have Biddles a cooking for you can say Jack Robinson. <laughs> Jack Robinson. <laughs> and you stay out of my kitchen. I believe that kitchen happens to belong to my cousin Jake. Well, I's a granny. And grannies is closer than cousins. Now, when the granny's on the wife's side, I got clamped blood in my veins. <laughs> well, if you want to keep it there, you stay out of my kitchen. <laughs> hey, Uncle Jed, come on back. There's going to be a fight. Oh, I don't fight nobody twice my age. There ain't nobody twice your age. I happen to be on the sunny side of 45. Well, then move into the shade. You're drying up something awful. <laughs> Now, hold on, hold Who's on. Who's closer related to you, Jed? Her or me? I is, because I's a granny. You're a mother-in-law. I'm blood cousin. You're going to be... Oh, now, no, I reckon you're both just as close related to me as folks can be, because I love you both equal. And it'd pleasure me if you'd shake hands. And come out fighting. <laughs> come on, now, shake hands. Granny, you start it off. Come on. Now, shake hands. Come on, Granny, shake hands with Pearl. <laughs> hey, I know, uh, Granny, say something nice to Pearl. <laughs> Go on, say something nice. Pearl, I never did see anything prettier than the weather is today. <laughs> now, Granny. Well, that was friendly. <laughs> well, say something nice and friendly uh, about Pearl. Don't force her, Jed. I ain't forcing her. She's just trying to think up some extra special nice now, ain't you, Grant? Yeah, and it ain't easy. See? Oh, Pearl. She's always bragging on you. How pretty you are. What a nice figure you got. I bragged on Pearl's figure. You sure did. You said Pearl got the kind of figure a man likes. Yeah. And then I said. Too bad a man didn't get it instead of Pearl. <laughs> I wouldn't talk if I had a figure as bony as you. Now, Pearl. You're built like a sack full of horseshoes. <laughs> and you're built like a sack full of doorknobs. <laughs> now, let me tell you... Now, Pearl. Pearl. Uncle Jed, you're breaking up a good fight. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, why don't you go out and help your sister Jethreen? Well, what's she doing? I don't know. Find out what she's doing and go help her. Ah, oh, you never let me have any fun. No. <laughs> Asking you just as nice as I know how to stop all this backbiting and bickering. You're both fine looking women. I'm proud to be kin to you. Why, if folks didn't know, they'd think you was Ellie Mae's sisters. Aww. Oh, Ellie, honey. <laughs> now, why don't you take these two pretty girls swimming down to the Seaman Pond? That ought to cool them off. In the dead of winter? Oh, the water stays warm all year round, ain't Pearl? Yeah, it must be fed by some kind of hot mineral springs or something. Oh, th that ought to be mighty good for your rheumatiz, Granny. And I'll fix lunch while you're swimming. <laughs> I told you to stay out of my kitchen. And I told you that... Now, that that's enough. Been... Uh, and I hear one more word spoken in anger out of either one of you. Dog, if I ain't gonna take a switch to you. Hey, Pearl, Granny ain't too fond of swimming. I'd be mighty proud if you'd go with me. 
Oh, that's a mighty sweet invite, Ellie Mae. Earl, did you bring some swimming clothes? Yeah, I did. Well, now you run along, get into them. Well, I don't know. Come on, put them on. All right, doggies. I bet you Pearl in them swimming clothes has got the figure of a young girl. She better give it back before she stretches it out of shape anymore. <laughs> I didn't say it in anger. I'm smiling. <laughs> Ready for the water. She looks like she's been in it for six days. <laughs> Pearl, you are one of the finest looking women ever to come down out of the hill. And you're extra fetching in your swimming clothes. <laughs> I made it myself. The ticket, you say. <laughs> it's all hand work. No. <laughs> yep. Every gore and gussy then dart and tuck and ruffling and brick black, I did it all myself. Mm. Doggies, that's mighty pretty, and so are you, Pearl. Granny, did you ever see anything like Pearl in her bathing suit? No, sir, I ain't. <laughs> well, uh, come on, I'll show you the pond. Ellie Mae and Jethro's down there waiting for you. Cousin Ellie, while we was waiting for these ham hocks to fall, I'll race you to the fur end of the pond and back. Yo, wait till I get on this swimming cap. Oh, gorgeous. I wish I didn't have to wear this. Since that pond water's bad on my hair. Well, why don't you cut some of that hair off? Hey, that's a dandy idea. Would you do it for me, Jethro? Well, sure. <laughs> and I could find something to... Hey, there's some shears. <laughs> well, I get off close to my head, Jethro. Okay. I want it short as yours. <laughs> well, hold still. I don't want to shorten your head none. Jethro! <laughs> yeah, Uncle Jed? Hold on there. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? Fixing to cut Ellie's hair. Why get off short, Paul, so as it won't get in my eyes when I swim? I'd sooner cut off my arm than that beautiful hair of yours. Now, don't you never get a notion like that in your head again, nor you neither. You mean I gotta let my hair grow long as Ellie's? Jethro, <laughs> why don't you try using your head for thinking? I have tried, Ma, and it hurts. <laughs> Keep an eye on these two. I gotta go back up the house. I will, Jeff. Hey, Ma, you wanna race Ellie and me to the fur end of the pond and back? In the water? Yes, sir. <laughs> and get my swimming suit wet? Yeah. Oh, you do bear watching, both of you. <laughs> you see them ham hocks? Yeah, Ma. Where'd they come from? From pigs, I reckon. <laughs> How did they get here? Well, I took them out of the icebox. I was getting awful hungry. Was you going to eat them raw? Of course not. Huh. I was going to keep my swimming trunks on. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Mary. Yes, yeah, Pearl. What is this thing? It looks like a stove on wheels. Well, that's what it is. It's called a portable barbecue. You just put a fire in there, then you lay the meat on this thing. All right. Ellie Mae, you fetch some firewood. Jethro, you slice them ham hocks. <laughs> what would you like to hear next, Uncle Jed? Well, uh, can you play Dixie? Why, sure. I sure do like to sing that song. It's right good for dancing, too. Would you do a jig? Well, if the music happens to get down around my feet, I might just cut loose and stomp a spell. <laughs> Better take my coat off just in case it does. <laughs> I was in the land of cotton. Old times there is not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixie Lane. I wish I was in Dixie. Hooray, hooray. In Dixie Land I take my stand to live and die in Dixie. Away, 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 away down south in Dixie. Away, away, away. Away down south in Dixie. I wish I was 
Sergeant Dixie away from Pearl. <laughs> Dixie land, I'll take my stand away from a cousin of Pearl. <laughs> away, away, away down south in Dixie. Away, away, away from Pearl and Dixie. <laughs> oh, I was me away from Pearl, away from Pearl and old Pearl and away from Pearl and Dixie. <laughs> cooking, Ma. Uh, that's the truth. Wait till Jess Wing gets a whiff of this. Ham is her favorite. Mine too, Ma. Come on, hurry up. Jess Wing, what is that delicious smell I'm a smelling? It smells like ham we're cooking, Uncle Jess. Well, let's get on down to the cement pond and tell everybody we're going to have ham. <laughs> that is a shortcut. <laughs> when the family tastes these riddles, they ain't never gonna let Pearl near the kitchen again. Mmm. corn taste of these here corn flakes. Yeah, but you mustn't give them to me. We already got two women in this house fighting over who's in charge of the food. We can't have three. It's mighty good. Ain't nobody makes a better eating cereal than that there. Well, just this once. A Kellogg's good morning, the best to you each morning. K-E-L-L-O-double good Kellogg's best to you. The Beverly Hillbillies has been presented by Kellogg's Corn Flakes. From Kellogg's of Battle Creek. Now it's time to say goodbye to Jed and all his kin. They would like to thank you folks for kindly dropping in. You're all invited back next week to this locality to have a heaping helping of their hospitality. Hillbilly, that is. Set a spell. Take your shoes off. You all come back now, here. This has been a Filmways presentation.
And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.